Joining me to continue our conversation about free speech in sport are some illustrious athletes from the University of Michigan. Jeff Porter, I should say Dr. Jeff Porter, recently received his doctor degree, so I want to give him props. Um, a former Michigan athlete, also a two-time Olympian mm -hmm. in the sport of track and field. Mm -hmm. To my left is G. Ryan, an outstanding uh, swimmer for the University of Michigan. And also we have Jaron Fish, who is an outstanding student athlete in the sport of track and field. So we're going to have a roundtable discussion. Um, so much has been made about athletes speaking out in sport and expressing themselves and I thought what better group for you to hear from than the athletes themselves. So to begin our conversation I want you all you know people there are people who say athletes are representing the university they're in uniform they don't need to be saying anything personal because that is not the platform that is not the time so I'd like for you to all to address this is sports a viable platform for social and political activism. I'll begin with you, Jaren. Um, I believe it is. Why provide us with the platform um, if you then don't allow us to use it? And the only time people claim that we abuse the platform is when they disagree with the stance we're making. Mm -hmm. And that goes both ways. That's not even to say to take one side. And also, I believe social justice, I mean, that this. if you look at the current climate within our nation and within our world, a lot of voices need to be heard, and if I can help others' voices be heard, why would I not use my platform as an athlete to help that? Mm -hmm. Outstanding. What, do you, what are your thoughts about that, G? I think sports already is a political platform. and It's already being used as such, and so the only question that comes up is do we allow student athletes to have autonomy and their own voice to add to the conversation rather than just being like pieces that get moved around? So absolutely, it's an appropriate place. It already exists as such. Mm -hmm. It's just allowing more people into the conversation right. to represent themselves. Absolutely. Okay. Jeff? I think I'll, I agree. I think there is a different perspective I'll put on the conversation of um, the athletes didn't give themselves that platform. This country mm -hmm. uh, loves entertainment. We spend billions of dollars on entertainment, mm -hmm. and athletes are part of that entertainment right. value. And so if you put a lot of stake on to entertainers, athletes, and naturally you're going to have a platform to be able to speak on. The challenge, as you alluded to, is there's, the problem comes in where you don't agree. Right. Mm -hmm. The entire industry of sports is already political. Look at the owners of the major teams, look at the, who they're donating to. It is political in nature. They're upset and the, uh, ang the anguish and the anger comes in where the athletes start saying things that go against what their core values of the ownership and those in power uh, believe. And mm -hmm. so that becomes the problem. But should athletes uh, uh, be able to speak their opinion? Absolutely. That's what these universities are designed to do. They're not designed to get uh, to make sure that I have a technical skill. They're designed so that we can critically think and think for ourselves. That's mm -hmm. why we have these universities at this in this country. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I think it's interesting because notwithstanding the debate, we're seeing an, an increase mm -hmm. in the number of athletes who are speaking out. And I don't, I don't mean just at the collegiate level, but we, there are even high schoolers mm -hmm. that are starting to say things. So what's happening now? Why is there an increase in this conversation? I mean, you know, we, we're gonna, we can talk about some of the risk in a minute, but I just want you to first tell me, why are more athletes speaking out now? What's going on? I think, What's happening now is that athletes are starting to be more conscious of their environment. They're starting to be aware of some things just don't feel or mm -hmm. seem right. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they're doing more research. I mean, at this point, you can find anything you need to find on Google, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> and you can take your time to find it. And so now you start to figure out, well, this doesn't seem right, or this impacts somebody that I care about. Mm -hmm. And once you, those two things conflict, then that's when athletes start taking a stance. Okay. What are your, what are your um, thoughts? I definitely agree. I also think a lot of it is accredited to this um, rapid expansion of social media. I mean, it has been an increase, but you look at the past um, people like Bill Russell, Tommy Smith, uh, Muhammad Ali. So there have always been athletes speaking out against social injustice, but I, you also look at what happened to them. I mean, these are some of the greatest athletes ever and who were revered in their sport, but then criticized in their everyday life for their, the color of their skin, essentially. Um, and so I think athletes were scared, and I understand that fear, but uh, with social media, you see a lot of people say like, hey, I'm not the only athlete going through this, like we all agree. So if we come together, it's easier for one person to, for it's easier for a team to take a knee than it is for one person, which is why Colin Kaepernick was alone, but then you look two years later, and you have a bunch of football players right. through professional, collegiate, and high school. Mm -hmm. 
Do you want to add to that? Yeah, and I think along with social media, we we can see the effect that organizing and that young people have in this current political climate. Like it's, it's making change and, and voices are being heard and having an impact. And that's a really powerful thing to be able to say that, yes, we can we can organize, but not only that, we can achieve. And as more rights and protections are being threatened and, and people are experiencing these oppressions daily, that there's that motivation to act mm -hmm. and to speak. So you, you all talk about why, why there's an increase. I mean. But we also know there are risks, mm. right? I mean, you, you you don't take a stand without some consequences and some risk. Mm -hmm. You all have been activists in your own right in a lot of different ways, either based on race, based on gender, gender identity, um, or the overall organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, you all have been activists. What gave you the courage to do that? And and there's a two-part question. What mm -hmm. gave you the courage, and where was your support? You talk about teams, so talk to me about why you did it and who supported you to give you confidence in this process. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, the why is because I felt that something needs to change. Mm -hmm. Once you get to a point, whether it's an athlete or a person walking down the street, when you figure out that it's not only you, but a group of you, a group of people need to uh, have the ability to change something. And you get tired of status quo. Mm -hmm. You get tired of the monotony. You get tired of just falling into that box. And you have the ability, you realize you have the ability to make change. That was the why. I didn't want to continue go down this road. When you saw so many things, you can't turn a blind eye into it anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't act like it doesn't exist. Uh, the thing that gave me courage is that I recognized that some of my predecessors in uh, within the university setting and within um, the track and field world did exactly in what I was trying to do. They had the platform that I did. Tommy Smith and John Carlos aren't just legends. I mean, they're historic figures. Mm -hmm. And they took a stance on things that they believed in. So I knew that, had conversations with them and other activists around the country. But yes, the risks are, are real. People will criticize you. People will say you're not um, as well informed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people that could, you could lose your job. Mm -hmm. Right. And all these things matter, but that's, you know, with those risks, you know, that's why I continue to step out and, and, and have those conversations. Um, I think for me, it was the realization that I was already at risk mm -hmm. as an athlete or not. As a black female, I'm already subjected to certain stereotypes, certain derogatory terms, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then also, Jeff mentioned the predecessors. They were already at risk. You look at Jackie Ro Robinson, I already mentioned Bill Russell. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, five uh, MVPs, 11 championships for the Celtics, and Boston fans broke into his house, trashed trophies, wrote derogatory terms all over. So, like, he was already at risk activists or not. Mm -hmm. So I think it is my duty, especially, I mean, I do have a privilege, I don't know how much times have changed, uh, that's up for debate as well, mm -hmm. but right. it's definitely a different time and right. I have this platform, I can use this platform and I think I'm at, uh, I don't have as great of a risk as the athletes before me, especially black athletes back then did and so I feel like it's my duty. As far as mentors, um, I've had a great mentor such as Jeff. Uh, <laughs> no, did you pay her to say that? No, he didn't though. <laughs> Seriously though, Jeff um, and other people such as my academic advisor and so forth, they have really created a safe space for us. They have really encouraged us even when we felt, I mean I know a lot of the times a lot of people are like, oh the institution's not going to have my back, whether that be the university or the team or the owner or whatever it be and I've definitely had an opposite experience. I definitely know there are people in my corner that if I feel like I want to say something, I have something on my chest that people will support me. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Having a safe space makes all the difference in the world. G, what are your thoughts? I would say the why, like why I chose to start advocating and, and start being a more vocal activist is because it got to the point where I couldn't separate out my, my sport identity from my other identities. I mean, I, I lived and moved through the world, through classes as a trans non-binary person, then I showed up into a sport that's, that's binary. It's, you know, it's men's and women's. Mm -hmm. Um, and and at that point, I couldn't I couldn't code switch anymore between the two, and so the choice was I can stay in my sport and I can I can change it so that I fit, or I can leave. And I didn't want to leave. It's it's a wonderful opportunity, um, and so that was that was the motivation. That was it, it. Just got to that point where I had to flip a switch, um, and support came from all across the university. I had teammates and friends in the athletic department. Um, I had a lot of support from our LGBTQ Resource Center on campus, the, the Spectrum Center, and just people who were there who not only helped me like write things out and process my thoughts, but who were like, I will help you if you, if you go and advocate for yourself or others, I will be there in whatever mm -hmm. form you want me to be. Mm -hmm. Very good, I mean, you, you all are very insightful. Um, I wanna follow up on something that you, uh, you mentioned, privilege. Mm. 
we know that in certain situations or certain athletes um, that may have privilege mm -hmm. in, in so much as that when they speak out, it carries weight, it becomes validated. Um, so I want you to think about the notions of privilege and how that shapes free speech mm -hmm. and who can speak out. We see a lot of males speak out. We see a lot of um, athletes in the high visibility sports of football and basketball. Mm -hmm. Talk about elements of privilege and how that influences free speech in sport. I think that privilege is a really hard concept within this arena because privilege to who? So yes, while my counterparts in Schembechler and Chrysler might have a bigger platform and more people may listen, they also have more at stake, which I cannot even fathom. I mean, of course, there are things that I can lose, but not nearly as much as they could lose. And that's just a matter of the fact. That's not necessarily the university. That's just kind of like across the nation. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it is a privilege to have that platform, but I also think that me being a track athlete, maybe not as much of a visibility sport, that I also have the privilege because I can ha go on my Twitter and say whatever I want. I mean, not whatever I want, of course, <laughs> I have limitations, but um, I can definitely say a lot more about uh, the p current political climate more so than um, some of my football friends or basketball friends could. And so I think that's a privilege because I do have a lot I think I have a lot more wiggle room than they do, even though there are still constrictions within uh, the university as a whole. Right. Very good. I, I, I agree. I, sometimes the bright lights is not always the best place to be, right? Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are your thoughts, G? I think privilege is a lot about how you're able to navigate those, those power dynamics that exist within athletics as far as who gets to tell you what you can and cannot say, whether you're hyper-scrutinized or whether you can fly under the radar a mm -hmm. little bit, and, and how much freedom you have to really express dissent. Like, what, what happens if your free speech goes against or, or criticizes the University of Michigan. You don't want to do that in a way that is, is hypercritical and, and um, it paints the university in a poor light, but you also don't want to lie and be everything you know, fine and dandy because that's not true either. So it's, I think it's a lot about finding that balance mm -hmm. between the two. Right, right. I uh, 100% agree. I think in a different realm, privilege has now become, um, it's become a moving target. Mm -hmm. Because privilege used to be up the upper echelon, those who were in power, typically white men that controlled um, the vast majority of the resources. But now you're starting to find out that, well, there's different kinds of privilege. Male privilege, there's heterosexual privilege, there's sport privilege. No one really cares about Jeff Porter as an Olympian until the Olympics show up. And that's where we get to the privilege that I have on standing on as being a heterosexual male. I'm able to speak on certain things, but there's some things I can't speak on. So privilege ends up having a, 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 a it's moving target, but it, be, it becomes one of those, uh, those topics uh, that whoever has that privilege ha commands the audience's attention a little bit more. They'll listen to, whether right or wrong, they'll listen to, which is not always fair because I'm not as qualified to speak on certain topics as Doreen or G mm -hmm. or you, mm -hmm. but you'll listen to me. Well, that's where this entire activism platform needs to come in because if Jareen and, and G and Jeff and Keisha decide that we want to talk about it. We can speak about whatever topic we, met, we, we want to talk about from our different privileged perspectives. Mm -hmm. Then people will have to listen because we cover a, a whole variety of perspective privileges. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know what? I want to also talk about another concept. Um, first of all, excellent illustration of, of privilege and, and I, I like the nuance. And you're right. Privilege is a moving target. I want to talk about another concept that may also be a moving target. Sportsmanship. Oh, well. <laughs> So when we think about sportsmanship, I mean, that's fundamentally what sport is all about. It's about fair play. It's about having rules, making sure it's <laughs> fair to everyone. That's what this sport thing is all about, that's right? What it's all about. So there are people who think that the whole notion of athlete expressions, i.e. celebration, end zone celebrations perhaps, or any type of expression, that it should be curtailed because it's not good sportsmanship. So I want you to talk about this concept of how sportsmanship may or may not curtail athletes freedom of speech freedom of expression um okay so the notion sportsmanship as a concept i agree with however i don't ag i think that some of the current rules are a bit excessive i do believe that athletes should be able to celebrate it's just a celebration i mean a team's going to be upset if they lost one way or the other i don't think the celebration is necessarily going to change that um, I do think it should be respectful, however, but at the same time, I think being an athlete is kind of lonely, and regardless of your sport, the only other people who can truly understand that are athletes, so the idea of some sort of form of respectful camaraderie, I agree with. I just think that sportsmanship, to the extent it's at now, 
um, not necessarily egregious, I wouldn't go that far, but it goes back to the idea of us being tools and not necessarily individual beings. Right. I like that. I like that way, the way you frame that. Mm-hmm. G, what are your thoughts? Only certain kinds of celebrations are censored. And I mean, that, if, if that's how we employ sportsmanship, then that's, that's the exact opposite of the way that I see the concept. And so if it's going to be a blanket statement that no one ever celebrates ever, then that, that seems really wrong. And we can recognize that, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And so if we, don't, <laughs> I mean, if we, only, if we only choose to censor certain kinds of celebration, that goes against sportsmanship. Mm-hmm. Uh, sportsmanship is, is we play by the same rules. You know, we were taught when I was playing football, if I knock you down, I'm going to pick you back up so I can knock you down again. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> that's, that's where, you know, that was the genesis of how I learned sportsmanship. The celebrations, you must understand that sports is still entertainment. And the celebrations get mocked and mimicked across, uh, across the globe. And I've seen them. They're, they're hysterical. <laughs> but that's what draws people and that's what draws fans in. The challenge is, is that when people are saying these kinds of comments, it's not about sportsmanship. Mm-hmm. It's about censorship. Because you don't want to seem like all, uh, back in the 60s it was called a hot dog, right? You don't want you want to seem like that guy that draws all attention to himself. But people get excited about those celebrations, right? We saw game-winning shots last week in the March Madness, and a team is celebrating. They're running around like like idiots, but they're having a great time. Is that not unsportsmanlike? But well, we always had guys to congratulate their teams. That's also sportsmanship, but the fact that it's still entertainment value, and so you can't come out and say, oh, well, this is sportsmanship, as G alluded to, and this is not, because this <laughs> makes me feel uncomfortable. Right. That's the final line, is what makes you feel comfortable, what mm-hmm. makes you feel uncomfortable, I'm going to try to censor what makes you feel uncomfortable. Well, speaking of entertainment, and perhaps feeling uncomfortable, let's talk about fans. They have well, fans. seemingly embraced this notion of free speech. Now, you're all are athletes. I'm sure you've heard fans say some things to you that may not that made you feel a little bit mm. uncomfortable. Let's talk about what you think should be the rights of fans in the context of free speech. <laughs> <laughs> that, that goes back to the original <laughs> the original point, right? We love free speech, but remember, sometimes free speech doesn't agree with our perspective. Mm-hmm. Jareen made a great point. It's now, as long as it doesn't hurt me or isn't widely offensive, then, you know, you tell people, you know, this team isn't good in G-rated language, right? This mm-hmm. team is bad, whatever. And that's part of being a fan. But when you get into the derogatory, mm-hmm. that's where you have to draw the line because that ceases to become my fandom versus now you're starting to show your true colors. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? Um, I think that's hard because at the end of the day, you're trying to regulate individual people. Um, But I also think that's why athletes should be allowed to freely express themselves. Mm -hmm. So I only say that because fans, at the end of the day, they say whatever they want about us. Mm -hmm. Positive, negative, indifferent. It doesn't matter to a certain extent. And nine times out of ten, athletes tend to refrain from any type of engaging any type of discourse. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, athletes do understand that they are representing an institution that is larger than them. That's it's not like there's some misconstrued concept going on. Athletes Mm -hmm. are like, oh, do they forget that they represent the University of Michigan? That's not the case. So that being said, if I want to defend police brutality, Mm -hmm. that's not necessarily hurting anybody. Why should I not be able to do that? Especially when there are people yelling all types of whatever bombs at me. I mean, they might not even know me. I just, I'm on a different team, so right. whatever. So I feel like, I mean, if that's allowed, which it is, then I should be allowed to freely express myself mm-hmm. in another realm, which does not hurt anybody. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. G? And I think where, where speech and free speech gets to the, that part where it can, and it can hurt and harm people is when you start attacking the individuals for things that are not related to sports, mm-hmm. right? It's not about performance. It's not about how anyone scores or races or whatever. It's, it's who they are as a person and identities outside the realm of sports. Yep. And I think, I think that's the part that becomes harmful. And so the same way, if, if we're going to have free speech to defend ourselves, then we can't censor other people's free speech. Mm-hmm. You know, it's pretty evident that you all are revolutionaries. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just pretty evident right here. And so the athletes are leading this movement. We are in, a, in an interesting time in our country with this notion of this, this consciousness that we're seeing among athletes. Probably not to the same extent of your coaches. So I want to know, given your activism and your social consciousness, I'm sure you're far ahead of some of your coaches, some of your staff. That's just this generation. Uh, I'm that way. I'm a faculty member. Some of my students, they're at a different place than I am. And I respect <laughs> that. So I want to talk about 
how it is because you're leading this how is your coaches how are your coaches sort of helping you or are you helping them to like join this social movement bandwagon wow um okay so <laughs> first and foremost uh i love my coach mm -hmm. um coach henry is really supportive of me as an individual mm -hmm. um in every realm not just the social justice mm -hmm. realm uh, you did mention, though, it is generational. Mm -hmm. And um, you see that across right. races, gender, mm -hmm. and so forth. So I think to a certain extent, a lot of coaches, they just want to stick to the sport. Yeah. They won't touch it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily know my coach's political opinions mm -hmm. to the dense extent that he knows mine because I always <laughs> express mine. Right. So um, I think it's kind of just continuous conversation, but at the end of the day, you do have to respect that they grew up in a different time and I'm not necessarily going to force my coach mm -hmm. into a, a extremely uncomfortable situation. Mm -hmm. As long as I know he supports me, right. I'm okay with that at this point in my career. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. See? Yeah. I think it's, I think it's definitely generational. I think it, it's definitely a different kind of, of understanding. And I would say that my interactions with my coaches have been a lot about uh, breaching this this knowledge gap, breaching mm -hmm. this educational gap that exists between what they understand and particularly as as gender and what I embody and understand as gender, and so it's mm -hmm. it's existing and and part of asking for support is asking for respect and asking for like correct pronouns, correct mm -hmm. name, and that kind of thing, and that gets complicated because it's it's hard for people to change. It's hard for people to get that that mm -hmm. new idea, and so. It is, it is about education, and it's also about finding the compromise. Mm -hmm. finding, finding like, okay, what, what do I need, and what can I kind of acquiesce to mm -hmm. that, that may not be exactly what I want, but is, is perfectly fine. Right. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, I mean, as, as current you know, Michigan athletes, you're having the courage to have those conversations, and you're respecting where your coaches and your staff members are in the process. And, you know, the whole idea is to meet people where they are, right? And it sounds like that's what's, what's happening. What about you, Jeff? Well, it's funny, you know, they're leading the charge, right? You're, it's absolutely generational because the folks that grew up in the 60s mm -hmm. and the 70s have a completely different outlook on how the world works as the millennials, mm -hmm. right? The ones that are born like in 92, which makes me feel a little old. Right? <laughs> um, but they're, they're helping them come along. There's some things that I would have never thought about that mm -hmm. these two are bringing up to our attention. Like, mm -hmm. oh, well, I have never thought about that. I can sit and honestly tell you I didn't, have never thought about that. And now because of that, you know, our student athletes, our, our athletes across the board, uh, whether whatever realm we're in, whether it's high school, college, or professional, are mm -hmm. bringing the administration along. Right. Because administration is typically the last to change. Institutions mm -hmm. are inherently systems, and systems are very, very difficult to change. Mm -hmm. But once you start getting people infiltrating those systems and pulling them out, that's when the conversations can happen. Because it's one thing um, if you identify as one thing. You have to identify as something, just one thing. Then I can put you in my box. Mm -hmm. If you identify as all these other things, then I don't know how that works. Now the challenge it becomes more complicated. Now you and I are friends. Right. So now you just warp my entire my entire mental construct of how I see the world. So now mm -hmm. I have to understand your perspective. Right. And you're seeing the athletes take charge in that right. because they're the ones who are um, forced. The stereotypes and identities are forced upon them. Mm -hmm. G alluded to. There's male and female. At the international level, we're still having those conversations. Do, do we know how to do it? Absolutely not. And there's a whole bunch of other topics that we haven't even dived into that are going to come up sooner or later. Mm -hmm. But having these conversations and having athletes lead them, because if the athletes didn't bring those up, we would never, and the systems would never change. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to follow up on one more thing before we bring this very vibrant conversation to a close. Uh, you talk about at the international mm -hmm. level, and you have extensive experience on the international sports skate. Mm -hmm. Talk about or compare and contrast this whole notion of free speech in sport domestically and globally. Is there a difference? Are they <laughs> oh. more outspoken? Help us to understand the similarities and the differences. Uh, there are more differences than there are similarities. Mm -hmm. okay. um, athletes in the United States benefit from our understanding of the Constitution of what we think free speech is. The problem becomes when you go through some of these other countries that have, a, whether it's a communist regime, a uh, political turmoil, a, a apartheid, um, a coup in the government, and you think you still have that same privilege of being able to say what you think. That is not the case, not at all. And so countries have limited the ability of their athletes to speak their minds. Mm -hmm. Cuba is one of them, China is another one. I'll give you an example. And a, a few years ago at the World Championships, you had a, a four by four um, uh, relay that won a medal for Russia. You have two women on the podium who kissed. 
Hmm. Never seen those two athletes again. Oh. Ever. Yeah. I've never seen those two athletes again. I think it was 2015 or something like that. I've never seen them again. And so Russia doesn't really like certain things. Yeah. China doesn't like certain things. Mm -hmm. um, some of the South American countries don't like certain things. And because of that, those athletes are fully aware of what they can and cannot say. Even where it goes to represent their country at the international level because they realize there are repercussions and some of the repercussions are very serious and mm -hmm. dire if you go against the regime. Right, right. And so we have the ability as Team USA to challenge their thought process, to mm -hmm. challenge um, what people inherently think. Because what happens if you bring someone into Let's say don't uh, a country, a Middle Eastern country, which will happen soon, doesn't particularly care for the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. Great, when we're bringing Team USA into that country and some of the members are from the LGBT community. Now they have to deal with that and they don't want to, but they're gonna have to. They're not fans of it, but what happens if they do something on the podium to protest or they do something out where it gets media attention? Mm -hmm. And that's where Team USA has to be very careful of how to respect the other culture, but then respecting other culture, identity, and uh, living up to who you are all come and converge on one and you that's where you have the conflict right right wonderful i mean it so we talk about the notion of free speech in the u.s and um notwithstanding the challenges and controversies here it sounds like it's not that bad compared to how it is in, oh, in other countries no, right it, it's not yeah <laughs> well as i conclude this you know um you've heard this notion that athletes should shut up and dribble shut up and run shut up and jump shut up and swim Obviously, that's not your perspective. So as we conclude this discussion, share with us any call to action or closing remarks you have about free speech in sports. Um, I think when it comes to free speech in sports, especially when it comes to non-athletes looking at uh, free speech in sports, you have to remember that the athletes are more than just athletes. That we, when we're done shutting up and dribbling, that we go home to families mm. and we face hardships and challenges just like everyone else. And that being said, then we should be allowed to freely express ourselves. It has to go beyond the sport. If you're a Michigan fan, Okay, fine, be a Michigan fan, but I'm more than just a Michigan athlete. I'm also a Michigan student. Uh, I'm also a Maryland native. Like, there's more to me than just my sport, and you have to look beyond that. Yeah. Wonderful. Gee. I think it comes back to what we get told as, as student athletes at Michigan is that we are, we are leaders in whatever it is that we choose to, to go forward in. And as, as that is the case, we become ambassadors for the university, but also for our own beliefs. And if we're going to lead in social justice areas, that's going to be pushing everyone. It's going to be pushing coaches and administrators at the University of Michigan as much as it is pushing fans and other students and people outside of our university community. And so I think that it's important to hold in mind that we are, we are in some ways given that as, as a jumping off platform. And then what we choose to do with it is our own individual decision. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. The thing you bring up with the idea of we should shut up and dribble, shut up and play, shut up and run, shut up and swim, uh, it's the idea of being grateful. Right? Mm -hmm. Athletes are grateful. Athletes are absolutely grateful for the platform they have. What folks need to understand is that because we have the platform doesn't mean we won't use it. Now, you have to we didn't give ourselves this platform. Mm -hmm. Okay, It was given to us, and because we pay so much attention to it, entertainers, as, I, as I've alluded to before, now we have that platform, you have to understand that we're going to voice our opinion. Now the only thing I would encourage, um, whether it's athletes, whether it's fans, whether it's administrators or whoever, to understand, find out the whys. Let's have that conversation. Let's find a meaning behind everything we're doing. You cannot just assume that the athletes are uneducated because they're protesting something, mm -hmm. or it's just a fad or something that's going to go out of style, but you don't know what you're talking about. Why not? Mm -hmm. You don't believe I've actually done my adequate research to be able to form an opinion because I just want to watch you play. Because mm -hmm. I want to watch you play, I want to watch G be successful with national championship. That conflicts with my mindset of, of what G's identity is. And mm -hmm. why is that a problem with, for you? And so I encourage fans and athletes to engage in that dialogue to understand where the athletes are coming from before you start going down the road of your being ungrateful uh, or any of the uh, appropriate similarities. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you all have done an excellent job of illustrating and articulating the why. And I really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Jeff Porter, two-time Olympian, former uh, Michigan athlete, G. Ryan, outstanding swimmer here at the University of Michigan, and Jaron Fish, outstanding track athlete here at the University of Michigan. Thank you all for an engaging and enlightening conversation on free speech in sport. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. All right.